Good morning and praise the Lord. It is uh, Sunday, April the 14th, I believe, a day before tax day in the United States. Um, this is Sunday morning, Central Florida. We are Devoted Ministry Church. I'm Pastor Edmund Bullock. My wife is behind the camera. I'm so glad you're here with us. I know it's not Sunday morning for you because we're not recording this live, but whenever you're viewing this, I praise God that you're here. I'm going to say a brief prayer, and we'll start with the Word of God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, for your blessings. Thank you for using me as your oracle. Touch every heart who hears your Word. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, I'm going to be talking about antichrists. That's plural, not the antichrist, but antichrists. Um, the Bible uses that word in plural. John, in his letters, wrote several times about antichrists as well as the antichrist. Jesus talked about the antichrist. The antichrist is referenced in Revelation, but we're going to talk about antichrists this morning. So listen, first of all, the first mention of Antichrist, not the Antichrist, but the spirit of Antichrist, is in way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 315, and I'm going to read that. God is speaking now to the woman as he judged her when she had sinned, he's has talked to the serpent, he's talking to Adam, but this is his words to Eve regarding the spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, talking to the serpent here, he's not talking to Eve. I will put enmity, enmity. <laughs> I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now you might say, how is that Antichrist? How is that a mention of the spirit of Antichrist? That is the first mention of the war between the devil and Christ. His battle to hurt, to strike to defeat Jesus. That's his spirit. That's the spirit of Satan. And that is the spirit of Antichrist. Opposition to Christ. God here is mentioning an opposition uh, by the devil directed at Jesus. Opposition to Jesus. Contradiction of Jesus. Praise God. That's the spirit of anti-Christ. We know that the that prefix anti means against or opposed to. All right? Now let's look at some notes here that I have in my Bible. I'm going to be do, doing some moving around here this morning. So I want to read actually what John said in his letter. 1 John 2.18. 1 John 2.18. Let's see what that says. Here it is, right back here. Praise the Holy One of God. Praise Jesus. 2.18 says this. Little children, it is the last time. That means these are the last days. That's what he's referring to. And as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come. You've heard that that Antichrist shall come. Now, where did people hear that? What was John referring to? He was referring to things that Jesus had said, and maybe more than that. It's not recorded here, but I'm sure it was discussed among the apostles. But Jesus had talked about the spirit of Antichrist in his teachings when he said, Somebody is going to come, false teachers, false preachers, false prophets. They're going to come. He said, many will come in my name. Doesn't mean they're going to come in my name worshiping me. They're going to come uh, bearing my name or under the guise of my name or under the flag of my name, but they will be phonies. 
That is the spirit of Antichrist, and we're going to talk more about that. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists. Now John here refers to the Antichrist that Revelation talks about, one particular individual, but he says, even now, right now, before that Antichrist comes, praise God, there are many Antichrists here in the world right now, whereby we know that it is the last time. He says, this is how we actually know it's the last time, because the Antichrists, many Antichrists, are in the world. And what he's referring to there is Jesus was, when Jesus talked about it, he says, this is how you will know that you are in the end. Because many antichrists will come. Now, John the apostle here wrote this first letter between the years 95 and 110 AD. That's a, that's a, uh, oh, 15 year spread here. We can't, pinpoint exactly, but it was within that 15 years when he wrote this letter. That was 1,900 years ago. It was actually over 1,900 years ago when John wrote this. But yet he said, this is the last time. I want to tell you something. It's in scripture here. Peter talked about it. There are those who say, where is the promise of his coming? <laughs> Since the fathers fell asleep, y'all have been saying this for years and years and years and more years and years and years more than that. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. These are the last days. In the last days. Listen, John wrote this over 1900 years ago. I want you to look at it this way. First of all, what Peter said, I want to complete that. He said, listen, God is not slack concerning his promise. The reason so much time has passed over 1,900 years since John said these are the last days and nothing has happened yet. In other words, Christ has not come yet. Peter said it's not because God is, is slack concerning his promise, but he is, he is patient. He's long-suffering, and he doesn't want anybody to perish. When he told Noah to build an ark and to preach, he gave 120 years. Noah spent 120 years working on that ark and preaching the gospel. The Bible tells us later that he preached. We won't find that in Genesis. 120 years. And the last seven years, at, at year 113, God said, now you go out and tell them one more time. And he said this. He said, tell them that it's seven more years. Tell them that they have seven more years. If God would give 120 years way back then, certainly he'll give 1,900 years again or 2,000 years because God does not want anyone to be lost. God is not slack concerning his promise, but he's slow to anger. He's long-suffering. He's patient. He's merciful, and he wants you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and be saved before it's too late. But, however, don't make any mistake about it. God is not marked. It's not mocked, I meant to say, not marked. God is not mocked. Praise God. Jesus Christ is coming. We are in the last days, the last of the last days. Praise God. So John said, these are the last times. And Jesus talked about, he said, this is how you'll know when you're in the last time. Because many antichrists will come. Now let's define this word antichrist. I have briefly, but I want to give you a specific definition. Right from This is actually right from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Antichrist, opposed to or hostile toward Christ Jesus. Now, I think I'm going to surprise you at this point because in this message I'm not talking about the world, Antichrist in the world, the spirit of the Antichrist in the world, the spirit of opposition 
or hostility to Jesus in the world. I'm actually talking about the spirit of Antichrist in the church, in the house of God. Opposition and hostility toward Jesus Christ, toward his word in the house of God. Among his own people. Praise God. By the way, John, in his letter, was not writing to the sinner. He was not writing to the world. He was writing to the church. So if the spirit of Antichrist was in the world, and there were many Antichrists in the world, when John wrote this letter over 1,900 years ago, certainly that spirit remains in the church I should say not in the world I, the reason I said in the world a moment ago because I was referring to John is saying that this spirit already exists in the world but he was not writing to the world he was writing to the church so let me rephrase that if that spirit was alive and active within the church when John wrote over 1,900 years ago, certainly that same spirit is, is alive and active in God's church, in the church where Jesus Christ is head today. And I dare say even more so. Matthew 12.30, I want to look at this. This is Jesus talking. Matthew 12.30. Jesus referring to that same spirit. I want to say this before I. No, I'm going to go ahead and read the verse first. That's what I want to do. He that is not with me. <clears throat> is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. I'm going to read that again. Jesus said this, he that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. So first of all, anybody who is not with Jesus uh, is with his enemy. If you're not with Jesus, and you're against him, that means you're with his enemy. And if you're not gathering with him, he said that means you're scattering abroad. Well, who's scattering? Who is scattering souls? That's the devil. Jesus is talking here again to, the, to his people. This is in the church. Listen, there are only two spiritual entities and they are by no means opposite but equal there are only two spiritual entities there is God and there is the devil who is his enemy but I want to make clear that they are by no means opposite but equal the devil is is not even remotely <laughs> he's not even remotely anywhere near the class or the level of power or the quality of Jesus Christ. He is a greatly defeated foe. Vanquished. His power has been taken away. A lion without teeth. The Bible doesn't call him a lion, but I want to paint a picture. With his teeth and his claws removed. The only thing that remains to him is his roar. He can make a great noise in the church. He's a great liar, the father of lies. He was a liar from the beginning, Jesus said. Praise Jesus Christ. But if you're not with Jesus, then you're with him. Jesus said that in Matthew 12, 30. He who is not with me is against me. He who is, who is not gathering with me is scattering abroad. There's no middle ground. There's no third choice. Either you're of God and in Christ, operating in the Holy Spirit, living by this word, preaching and teaching this exact word of God, or you are a partner with, an instrument of 
and filled with the devil and working with him, through him, by him, of him, and you're doing his work, you're scattering abroad. I'm talking to church people. I'm talking to pastors, teachers, <clears throat> pastors, teachers, deacons, missionaries, uh, singers, performers, liturgical dancers, church musicians, you name it. Some of you, many of you, have the spirit of Antichrist in you, and that's the spirit you're operating in, and that's the spirit of the devil. Let's go further. I want to stay in Matthew. I want to back up to chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, Jesus is talking, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. First of all, I'm not finished with those verses, but who is going to say Lord, Lord to Jesus? The world? No, the church. You, pastor, pastors. Teachers, preachers, deacons, missionaries, saints of God, singers, liturgical dancers, church musicians, and so many more. Jesus said, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. So who is going to be rejected from the kingdom of heaven? Chief and foremost... Is the devil himself. If you will be rejected from the kingdom of heaven, you are going to be with the devil. Jesus said to the Jews, you're, not, you're of your father the devil. They said, God is our father. We have God for our father. He said, he said, God is not your father. The devil is your father, and the works of your father you will do. He wasn't just talking to the Jews. He was talking to you today. Us, we, his church, this very day. Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, ah, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody who is preaching right now while I'm preaching shall enter the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> Not everybody who is singing songs of worship shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody who says I'm teaching the Bible shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Not every liturgical dancer shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody who picks up an instrument and says I'm playing for Jesus in the church shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody who sings a song and records a song and sends it out to the public and calls it gospel music shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody. In fact, few will. How do I know that? Because Jesus said, the way is straight. The way into heaven is straight, and it is narrow. It's constricted. Mean, straight meaning constricted. There's no room for error, no margin of error. It's difficult. That word is interpreted as difficult. You got to be careful navigating through it. The way into the kingdom is straight, and it's narrow. And what did he say? He said, few there be that find it. Not many are going to find it. Praise God. Mm. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, those are the ones who are going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. The ones who are with him and gathering with him. All right? If you are against him, uh, you are, if you are against this word in any way at any time, you are not with Jesus. You are against him because he is his word. Praise God. And he said, my word shall never fail. It shall stand forever. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my word, not one jot or tittle, meaning not one dotted dot of an I or crossing of a T, will fail. Praise God. And if you are not 100% in line with this word, you're not with Jesus. You're against him. You're not gathering with him. You're scattering abroad. 
if you're not teaching according to this word exactly. And Jesus said, you're not with me, so you're with my enemy. And my enemy is going to be cast into the lake of fire, as are you. As are you. Because he says, you're not going to enter the kingdom. And I told you, there are only two entities. There are, there are also only two uh, uh, destinations, heaven or hell. Jesus. There are only two destinations. If you do not enter the kingdom of heaven, there's only one other option for you. The lake of fire. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? First of all, let me emphasize again before I continue. Certainly nobody in the world, no unsaved person is going to stand, no person who believed themselves to be unsaved. Because there are some people who believe themselves saved but are not. Nobody of the world is going to stand before Jesus and say these things. He has to absolutely be talking to his church. That verifies everything I've been saying. Maybe what I've been saying has rubbed you the wrong way. Maybe it has turned you off. Maybe it has made you angry. Maybe it has made you think, I don't know what I'm talking about. This verse, Matthew 7, 22, absolutely underscores and verifies everything that I've been saying that e even to the point of your being cast into the lake of fire. Because he said, many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have not we prophesied in, in your name and and, and have cast out devils in your name and have done many wonderful works in your name. That is the church. That is the church. But verse 23, it tells us what he's going to say to those people. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So first of all, before I continue, when he says depart from me, where are they going to be sent? Where are they going to be sent? If I'm so wrong, that preacher guy has a nerve. He must be crazy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Okay, if I'm so wrong, where are those people going to be sent to? When Jesus says depart from me, what's the third option if it's not hell? If you're not going to heaven, if you're not going to enter the kingdom, and you say, I'm not going to hell. Those people are not going to hell. Where are they going to go? Praise Jesus. Let's look at this. Mm. In my name or in your name. And I put your in quotation marks and quotes here under my notes. Because you might be like, like I was when I was younger. I've been reading this practically all my life. And every time I read it, I said, man, this is hard to understand. Because how did these people get to do these things if they're not in Christ, if they're going to be cast into the lake of fire? And if Jesus says, I never knew you, and you, your works were works of iniquity, how can you do these things in iniquity? Let me tell you something. Ah, praise Jesus. From the beginning, I'm going to use a word here called, this word is misappropriation. Misappropriation, and I don't have a de dictionary definition, but it's when you take something mm, and you apply it, you apply it out of its proper use for a different use, or you 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 apply to it, uh, and you know what, honey, give me give me an exact definition of that word. I, I want to use I want to use the definition exactly before I even go on with what I have here. Misappropriation. Praise God. Talking about in Jesus' name. Let's see here.
Okay, embezzlement that it uses the definition uses the word embezzlement. Embezzlement means to steal. To steal. I love that. To misappropriate something means to steal it and to use it for a different purpose, for a different reason. To steal it and use it for a different purpose. Listen. Since the beginning, the devil has been misappropriating the word of God and the name of Jesus. Let me show you what I mean. Way back when he came to Adam and Eve, well, he came to Eve. When he came to Eve, he misappropriated the words of God. He stole what God had said to Adam and Eve. And he used it for his own purpose. Praise God. To deceive Eve. When he came to Jesus in the wilderness of temptation, he misappropriated scripture. He stole the words of God and he quoted them to the word of God himself in order to deceive, in order to tempt. Praise God. Misappropriation. Now I say that for this reason. So it is not hard to grasp that there are many who are speaking in the name of Jesus right now, in the name of Jesus right now, singing, quote unquote, in the name of Jesus, preaching, quote unquote, in the name of Jesus, dancing, quote unquote, in the name of Jesus, uh, prophesying, quote unquote, in the name of Jesus, laying hands on, quote unquote, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! who are actually misappropriating that name. They're not actually operating in the name of Jesus. They're they're not actually with him. They are against him because if you're not with him, he said in Matthew 12, 30, you're against him. They're not actually, they're not actually gathering souls into the kingdom. They're actually scattering souls. They're misappropriating the name of Jesus. They're saying, Jesus said, they're going to say to me in my, in your name, We did these things. Jesus is going to say to them, yes, you quoted my name, but I didn't even know you. You were not working in my name. You are working in the spirit of iniquity, the spirit of antichrist, the spirit of antichrist. Listen, anti, hallelujah. You were actually opposed to me. You were actually hostile to me. Now, how can the church be hostile to Jesus? I'll tell you how. Because you didn't like my word. You didn't want what my word says. You wanted what you said. You didn't want to follow me. You wanted to go your own way. But you wanted to go in my name to deceive so that no one would know that you were actually not walking with me. Only those who were uh, moved and by my Holy Spirit would actually know that you weren't walking with me. But the majority, the masses would be deceived. They would think that you were actually doing those things in my name, but you were misappropriating my name. You had no authority to be using my name. Who else misappropriated the name of Jesus in the book of Acts? The seven sons of Sceva said, we adjured you in the name of Jesus Christ, whom Paul preaches to come out of the man. They were casting out demons or attempting to cast out demons in his name. That was a misappropriation. Praise God. Simon the sorcerer wanted to misappropriate the Holy Ghost. When he saw the power that the the apostles had by the Holy Ghost, he said, I'll give you a lot of money if you give me this power. That's misappropriation. Praise God. Misappropriating the word of God. I've already talked about that. The devil did that many times. Many of you are still doing that today. You are misappropriating the word of God. 
you are saying things in the word, but you're twisting them because you're of your father, the devil. And you're doing his works, the works of your father you will do. You are quoting scripture, but you're twisting it just enough to deceive the way he did Eve. And he didn't, he didn't mis, misquote it when he talked to Jesus, but he took it out of context. He misappropriated it, and he took it out of context so that Jesus uh, uh, would be tempted You're misappropriating the word of God. You're not preaching the true word of God. You're coloring it with the flesh. You're changing its meaning, but in a way that un unlearned people or, or people who are not filled with the spirit of God can't tell. Misappropriating the lingo of the Bible Lingo, that definition, let's def define that word. Lingo is the special vocabulary of a particular field or interest. So when I say you're misappropriating the lingo of the Bible, I call it church speak. That's my phrase. You're saying church things. You're saying biblical sounding things. You're saying spiritual things. You're saying things that it seems like God would say, but you're misappropriating church lingo. You're using it out of context. You're using it in the wrong way. You're deceiving people with it. Now, let's conclude this message. There are many antichrists in the world right now. Jesus said, that's how you'll know that I'm very, very soon to come. Praise God. First of all, I want to say to you who are doing those things, repent Repent. Repent before it's too late. Repent because your future is not heaven. Your future is hell. Your future is the lake of fire. Repent. Don't do it anymore. Ask God's forgiveness and stop. Get out of the pulpit. Get off the stage. Get out of the ministry. Secondly, I want to say this. To those of you who are seeking, really seeking God with your whole heart. Take this whole Bible in, in its entirety. And don't follow all of these foolish and blasphemous, blasphemous, wicked, evil uh, translations that are hitting this, hitting the public today. My, the latest I saw was the Gen Z Bible, Generation Z Bible. That's of the devil. That is of the devil. Jesus never said the things that are in that Bible that that Bible attributes to him. That that Bible is putting words in his mouth. Well, it's attempting to put words in Jesus' mouth that he never spoke. Jesus doesn't need a modern translation of his word. He does not. He doesn't need you to help him to reach the young. He doesn't need a version, his, his, his Bible written in slang so that people can understand. How many hundreds of thousands and millions came to Christ with this? I'm reading the King James Version. I'm not saying that this is the only version that you've got to read this. But how many souls came to Christ reading the King James Version of the Bible? It worked for me. It brought me to Christ. It worked for my daddy. In 1954, 53, it brought him to Jesus. It worked for Sister Baxter, the woman who raised us in the faith, when she came to Jesus in the 1940s. It worked for my grandfather, who couldn't even read. But he knew what it said because it had been read to him. And it brought him to Christ. And he's in heaven waiting for me to get there right now. It worked for my brother. Praise God. Another powerful preacher my brother Danny Bullock it worked for him it brought him to Jesus 
It worked for my wife. It worked for my father-in-law. It worked for my aunts and my uncles. Don't tell me God needs you to give, to give another translation of slang and trash and foolishness. So that people will understand what he has to say. This word has power. This word is Jesus Christ himself. He said my word will never fail. It will stand forever. And he said anybody who adds anything to this book. Or takes anything away from it. They will be cursed with the curses that are listed in here. If you're seeking God. Stay away from those foolish Bibles. And stop following those people who tell you that this is not enough. You need something new and modern. Praise God. Praise Jesus Christ. I'm going to stop preaching even though I feel like going on. Praise Jesus. Paul didn't need any new translations. Come on, Holy Ghost. Your mother didn't need any new translations. She came to Jesus and she brought you to church. Praise Jesus Christ. Your old pastor, that old country gentleman didn't need any new translation. Blessed be the name of my father. Praise God. I'm thinking about my Uncle Richard right now and I'm going to close. Who's 90 going on 92 years old right now still preaching and singing the gospel but I think about his testimony how one day he said I came home and I sat down to read the word of God he was a young man I don't know about 20 21 years old or something like that he said I sat down to read the word of God and he said I began to tremble because it Praise God, it convicted my heart. It convicted my soul. And I said, oh my God, I'm a sinner. And he gave his heart to Jesus. Sitting right there. He wasn't in a church. Sitting right there, all alone. He gave his heart to Jesus. And this word changed his life. He didn't need a new translation. This word has power if you let it work. God bless you.